attended L, I'm 86 years old, and during the war from 1943 to 44, I was a flight engineer and I came, was finished up actually on 103 Squadron at RAF Elsham Wolds in, near Barnaby. I was at home, it was on the Sunday morning, and uh, I was at home and uh, Mr Chamberlain was going to broadcast at 11 o'clock on the radio. So, Mum and Dad, I had, uh, let's say, uh, two more brothers at home and, and, and a sister. And uh, we listened to it, and uh, Mum and Dad said, well, it, it, there's nothing we can do about the sun in the Middle East. But the one in the army was away at Ross on Wye um, with the Territorials for an exercise. So we, mother sent my brother and I, Douglas, down to Wellington, which was the recruiting office, to see if there was any idea when they'd be coming back. And the army chap, said, I'm very sorry, I can't even tell you that at all, he said. They were there and, and of course it was months before he came home again anyway at all. And my father said, well, I, you know, he's 18 at all, and he wouldn't be in, but he stayed in anyway till, the, uh, till 1947, I think he came out, my brother did. Mm. Well, I, I, I left school in 1938, and I, went, I worked at one or two jobs, and uh, then when I was a, Getting well, nearly seven, nearly eighteen. Um, I was my birthday is the first of March. About the November, I asked my parents if they'd sign for me to go into the air force. I wanted to go in the air force, and of course I'd got an elder brother who was in the air force in the Middle East. The other next brother was in the army, and he'd been in since uh, September, for thirty-nine. And Dad and Mum weren't very pleased, but I said if I don't volunteer. I won't be able to go flying, which I wanted to do. Anyway, they decided that they would, and I joined up in July 42, uh, January 42, sorry, and uh, trained and eventually became a flight engineer in July 1943. Uh, from there, I was uh, on Lancaster's uh, at St Athens, and uh, I got posted to one group, and the holding unit for then was at Lindholm near Doncaster, posted to Lindholm and uh, after a week's leave I got posted to Blyton to crew up with the, with the crews. There was about eight engineers and about eight other crews and they were a pilot, navigator, bomb aimer, wireless operator and rear gunner. So to make up the seven crew on the, on the Lancaster they needed a, a flight engineer and a mid upper gunner and we joined up, uh, did the training on conversion onto four engine aircraft on the, at Blyton and I got, because my, my skipper was an Australian, we got posted to 460 Squadron at Binbrook. Because he hadn't got any uh, operational experiences, uh, he had to go on a second dicky trip with some, some other crew to get the gen. But unfortunately he was killed, he, would, he died, um, they were shot down and all the crew were killed and that. So we stayed at Binbrook a couple of times for a few weeks, did a couple of odd trips with crews there. Then we got posted to Wickenby, thinking we'd get a 12 squadron at Wickenby, thinking we'd get a, a skip again. No joy, so we did one or two more odd trips there. Then they said, oh, you're getting a, you're getting a new captain now, a new skipper, and he was a squadron leader, and he had been a, a Harwell, he'd been flight commander at Harwell. He'd, on his second tour, because he'd done his first tour on Blenheims in the UK and Wellingtons in the Middle East. Squadron leader Whitted was his name. So we had to go back to Foldingworth for him to convert the four engine. Then we arrived at Elsham in November 43 and he took over as B flight on 103 Squadron. Uh, on the last trip at Foldingworth, we, we got into severe icing and the icing broke the perspex on the starboard side of the cockpit and uh, the navigator and wireless up only flew in the battle dresses, didn't fly in clothes like us because they were curtained in and um, 
So the MO, after we had another trip flight up in the daytime, he took the navigator off. So we had to get another navigator who came to Elsham Wold, Dennis O'Neill Shaw, flying officer. And he was a second tour man as well. He'd flown on Wellingtons in the Middle East. So we had the captain, who was a skipper, who was a second tour, the navigator was second tour, and the rest of us, Bob Aimer, Wallace, up, two gunners and myself, were on our first tours. Yeah. The fact that he was he was experienced, the pilot, meant that he didn't have to go on a second dicky trip. So if the if the raid, when the raid was planned, the raid was uh, half an hour over the target, we were in the first, they cut it down to every five minutes. And we were always in the first five minutes because of his experience and because of the navigator's experience as well. So that was how it worked out. And that was the benefit of it as well. And we had our own aircraft. We kept our own aircraft, we didn't wait a minute. Unless we went on leave, as we went on leave in December, for it, and whilst we were on leave, another crew took it, and unfortunately, they didn't come back. But we got another one, and we flew that, and we flew that until the skipper had completed his 20 trips, and the navigator. And then um, the bomb aimer and I stopped at Elsham to finish our tours, because we'd still got to get up to 30. And the two gunners went to other squadrons, uh, and the Wallace operator, because he was Australian, he went back to 460 Squadron at Binbrook to finish his tour off there. So um, they helped us anyway in that way. So we were always in the first. Uh, and sometimes it was beneficial to be in the first five. Uh, you know, uh, the Germans would work through their radar and, and all the other stuff they'd got, and they'd find out the route of the air, what's happened, where the target was. Um, the Bomber Command tried to you know, mislead them about the target and so forth, but so they, they did sometimes and they didn't others. So by the time they got into the stream and going, they were hitting the people behind us actually, unfortunately, or fortunately as we say. <laughs> Well, initially, um, when they when they started, when they came here in 1941, they had Wellingtons, and then they converted to Halifaxes, and then the Halifaxes weren't very good, so they converted to Lancasters, and they had one or three squadron which had three flights, and there was, I think, they could had about 32 or 33 aircraft in the three flights, so forth on that end, and then in November. End of November 43, they decided to form another squadron, 576 squadron. And if you look at the, uh, the runway, the main runway runs where the monument is, the thing is there, straight back. Uh, 103 was on that side and 576 moved to this side. They took sea flight of 103 to start the, start the squadron and then they posted in people from different squadrons one crew or two crews with aircraft into 576 squadron. So that became a two flight squadron, same as 103 squadron was. So there was probably more, 35, 40, perhaps aircraft. Everyone didn't fly every night because there was something wrong with some of them, but they could, they could put uh, quite a lot of uh, aircraft up, you know, on, 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 a, on a sortie anyway. The engineer's job was to know the, the aircraft backwards, everything that operated on the aircraft, if it was possible, like the hydraulic system, the pneumatic system, electrics, um, all the systems go, control system. Um, you had a list also of fuses, which uh, all, you know, every system and, it, and the fuse, what it was, and if you had to change fuse for problems and so forth. And you control the, uh, the engine temperatures and uh, running of the engines. Um, you also uh, control the fuel. The fuel system on each wing was three, uh, 114, 383, 58. That was in three tanks. And the 114 run into the 380, uh, 383, and the other one was 580, was on its own. <clears throat> so if you got a full fuel load, uh, you used 
the outboard ones of the thing and then so that the other the 114 would run in. When that ran in, you would change to this one. Well, that's just the system I implode. Change to the main tanks, 580, so you were balancing the tanks all the time to do it as well. Control of the radar shutters and everything at all and keeping an eye on all the in engine instruments and all the instruments in particular as well. And also, <coughs> because you were sitting by the pilot, you were on the lookout on the starboard side, he was the port side. So you looked dead ahead, right round to the starboard wing, up as well. And sometimes, just have a quick glance over the captain's shoulder because he was flying it, if it was in cloud, he was flying on instruments. So he would be, he would be um, eyes down on the instruments perhaps as well. But that was the keep. And then they had a, a bulge on the starboard side, <coughs> the persplexion, you could, like that, and you could look down through that quick. He didn't like me looking down there at all. He said, <laughs> well, that was it. <clears throat> wow. And also, um, going along, we'd, we, you had a course to fly, but uh, about every 10 minutes, the captain would call up all the crew by their name, by their position, bomb aim and navigator, all the rest of it. <coughs> Everybody all right, yes. And then he would say to the gunners, well, I'm turning the aircraft to starboard. He would turn the aircraft on the starboard wing so the gunners could have a look down and the engineer and the wireless hop if he was in the Astrodome. Anything there, the same on the other side, would bring it up gently so that they could look up, tip it down very slightly so the rear gunner could get a good view at the back and the mid-upper gunner as well. So this was all crew cooperation. That was really cool, and everybody relied on everybody else. <coughs> if you had an, you didn't, you didn't say anything unless you had something to say that was for the operation of the aircraft. Uh, the navigator, the, I, I say, the skipper had told, you know, he'd called everybody up. Then the navigator would come up with a change of course. The Wallace operator would come up and say, "I've had this message from base." because he was listening out every quarter to the hour and every quarter past for one group would send out messages if there was anything to send, etc. <clears throat> and uh, then if, if you spoke, you know, if you said something, I would say, oh, well, I'm changing fuel tanks now, Skipper, to do it, and whatever I'm doing there, or if we'd got a problem, we'd discuss it, him and I, and as quick as we could and get it sorted out. You know, if it was an engine needed stopping and so forth and all that. And uh, that was it. You didn't didn't talk, and you only you called everybody by their rank, by their name, position, by their position. So you, everybody knew who everybody was talking to. So if you had somebody come in to the crew who wasn't normally in the crew, he knew. Like we had a signaler come one night, and uh, he quickly, you know, we said, look. We call everybody by their position. Right here, oh, I'll know that, so it's all right there. Isn't oh yes, feathering engines and so forth, putting fires out. And if possible, if you always check the fuel, see that you, if you've got enough fuel to get back. If, if people hadn't got enough fuel to back, get back and they were over France, they'd often bail out over France. The, the whole lot of them would at all. But if you got enough to, if you get enough to get back, say you were coming back from Southern France way, and you got enough to get into Manson or somewhere like that, uh, an aircraft airfield on the south coast, you'd have a try for it anyway. See what they could do. And it was on two, uh, not rollers, um, what's that? Things like this. To rails. rails up and down, yeah. yeah. And you clipped it onto the this side, the port side, and the, the starboard side was fastened to it. So it, it just clipped the seat and it slid up and down there. You could lock it, lock it, lock the seat, and that was all right. If you'd, and they all, you also had a bar which you could pull out and put your feet on. And they also they had a back rest which you brought around here. But you never used the backrest and you never used the bar at the bottom either. You just sat on that one. Uh, the reason for that was that the escape hatch was in the front, down 
where the bombing position was. And if you had to bail out, you wanted to be as quick as possible. To do the bar in, get off the seat, put the seat down, put the back round, that was it. And uh, I kept the skipper's parachute and mine behind his seat on the floor so that I could pick it up like this. And I could just beam it across and clip it onto his, clip it onto his chest, ensuring that the, <coughs> the what's name, the um, handle was on the right hand side so he would know what to do with it. to your skipper but because I was the flight commander the bomb army used to go in and speak to him um, and say yes we're all there and we're ready for what's then. Then they would then by about half past nine ten o'clock you'd know well sometimes before you'd know you were in operations which aircraft had been allocated to you uh, and which crews were going because not every crew went. Because our chappy was a flight commander if B flight, if A flight commander went, he didn't, or if the CO went, he didn't go. You know that was it. They always had somebody in control in coming back. <clears throat> so you assembled. Usually, went out to the aircraft, examined the aircraft when the ground crew had finished their daily inspections, did a quick air test about half an hour just to check everything out, and then came back, put it on the pan, and then. Uh, You'd sit around then, probably until um, it was briefing. And briefing was in the operations centre. You reported, and every every crew sat again. They had a table about this long, and the navigator got all his maps on it and that. And uh, you sat in crews, yes, you know. And uh, the wing commander just, you know, did the roll call. And then they opened the curtains, and then sometimes shoot. Uh, well, I, do, I can't ever remember a, a WAF being in there, a lighter being in there. <coughs> and you get all kinds of uh, thoughts expressed. <laughs> oh, we're not going there again, are we, or something? Oh, I got, nearly got the chop when I went there, somebody would say, you know, as well. So there'd be the briefing, they'd go through it and everything, Metman and all the rest of it, and then um, you'd either have a flying meal before or af after briefing at all, depending. So you went for your flying meal. And if it was after briefing, you always had your flying meal because you got bacon and eggs here at all. And uh, then you just went up to the squadron, got your kit on, transport took you out to the aircraft, quick check around again, sorted out. And by this time, we'd got takeoff time and the air traffic would decide which, you know, which aircraft if you were in the, if we were in the first five minutes, we were usually second or third off as well. One from one side, one from the other. One of five seven six, one of one o three would take off then. If you, if we were going out to Mablethorpe to go over the North Sea to a, to a target, we'd usually go out and call Ghoul Crow Base, Ghoul Crow Base, climbing all the time until it was time to come overhead and set course four main, main <coughs> and uh, then off we'd go, climbing again over the North Sea, climbing as high as you could get in actual fact to it, and following the route depending where the target was. If we were going down the south to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to the southern part of Germany uh, or France, we would go take off turn and go down to Reading <coughs> and we'd be 4,000 feet over Reading. Reading beachy head and then beachy head across to France and onwards on the, on the journey there as well. Um, once we went out to beachy head and uh, the jerrys were coming in and they were dropping red markers at beachy head to guide their aircraft in when we were <laughs> We didn't stop to shake hands and discuss the tea. You, you, it started as soon as you knew you were on ups in the morning. The, um, how shall I say, you didn't get de dead frightened, but you apprehensive. And the apprehension went all the time until you got back and with it and when you did your air tests and so forth. And then you'd, um, the, uh, extreme points were 
detection round setting up and then taking off because you knew that if you had any problems then if you had a wheel burst or a tire or a, um, and the carriage collapsed or you had a fire in an engine that you could quite easily not survive from it as well. You got airborne and once you got airborne and um, 120 knots miles per hour uh, you were pretty safe then you could afford to lose an engine and get away with it even load it up then. and then you you were apprehensive all the time you're not so bad if you were say flying over the North Sea you could relax just a little bit at night time uh, but as soon as you got you know within striking distance of the enemy coast you were you, it was apprehensive again because you didn't know whether the Germans were sending fighters out to attack you or whether you'd be attacked when you got over there. And you'd also see that, as I say, the, the uh, raid took half an hour. Well, you think that there's 800 aircraft in that half an hour and they all come into, out of the, that's like, into a stream like this to hit the target. So that's the target they all want to be in. So with the Avril, you can, you know, you hear an aircraft overhead. You don't see it, you hear it, you hear the engine. And then uh, you're flying along and all of a sudden there's a lot of turbulence and you know somebody's in front of you. So you're looking for it then at all and so forth. So often if you, if you had the turbulence and you had the, the noise of the aircraft, the skipper would say, keep an extra eye out of everybody, you know, the rest of us, and the five of us all together. Because uh, the navigator and the bomb couldn't see, uh, the Wallace up couldn't see it, and you, so you do that and so forth. And then, when you, it was the bomb would take over, and he, you, you had to fly straight and level in, you know, and so forth. Bomb doors open. That was a tricky time. Then you got the bomb doors open, and he would give directions to the skipper to, you know, right, right, left, left, so that you got the differentiation with it. Steady, steady, and then you'd feel the cookie go. Four thousand pound, you drop four thousand pound. Now you think if you've got something in your hand like that, and you drop it, that must weigh about what five or six pound. How it, it affects you. So once you got the cookie going, your heart comes out of your feet and it comes back slowly up to where it should be, and you as the lot goes as well, because it goes in its position so the aircraft can fly straight and level. Just didn't drop the first front or the back, they, they set it out. So do that, bomb doors closed. Then uh, one of the things that Wallace up did, that between the front spar and the rear spar was where the hangar for the 4,000 pounder was, was hanging up. So our Wallace operator, under the skipper's instructions, had the fire axe and he would stand over the, or, or kneel over the 4,000 pounder and if it didn't go when it, the, the, the bomb aimer said bombs away, he would chop it, the, the what's the name for it, to make certain it goes because although they were electrically connected to keep them heated so they didn't free, freeze, they sometimes did. So this was it, this was one of the things he had to do. Another, another thing was that um, when you dropped the bombs, you had to fly for about oh, a minute because where the cookie went, a flare went as well. So when the cookie hit the ground, the flare, 3,000 candle power, or probably more than that, they took a photograph. So you got a photograph of the aiming point. So if that was the aiming point, you were hoping to get the What's the name on there at all when he can do it? <coughs> but you you feel you feel you feel almost as, as if you're in a fighter because it's you know you've dropped fourteen thousand pound altogether and you've used the fuel and and the, you can get the aircraft about a bit then so, but when there's a load on it oh, it's shocking to to get him. It's in night time nothing at night time but they did on daylight trips they they had uh, escorts all the way. At, most cases. They even had them as far as Berlin because they had the Mustangs, the American Mustang, when it came over here. They put a Rolls-Royce engine in and it was a marvellous aircraft then. It was like the Lancaster, it was excellent. And so they could escort them with, with overload tanks to Berlin and back. So, you know, they, 
lost very few really on that respect. Uh, so. <laughs> fortunate because we had uh, H2S radar on our uh, squadron. We were one of the first to get it and the, um, the, the bomb aimer used to often, up until we got towards the target, he would sit and do the, with the navigator on the long seat and he would sit and do the H2S and uh, it was very good, particularly with coastlines, lakes and stuff like that or inlets from the, from the sea and you could, fight, you could see big towns on it, but you couldn't, you know, if you got rivers and stuff like that, it was all right, apparently, but you couldn't, you couldn't pick out part of a town from it as well. And then after about 20 minutes before the target, the, he'd come off that and uh, he'd get into the bomb aimer's position on the front. Time practice as well, and at night time as well. We used to drop bombs from various heights, up to 20 odd thousand feet, all controlled by the people on the floor at, um, at the bombing range. And we only dropped, I think the maximum weight we dropped was 30 pound ones. You would drop smaller ones of um, 10 pounds, something like that, I think. But the maximum one was, especially when you were up 20,000 feet, was that. And the target was a just a ring of some sort with an arrow to it and, and you have to do that. But you were controlled by the, on the, uh, by the controller at, at the bombing range. He would tell you, you could clear to run in now and so forth. So you would run in and do it and that was it, you, off you went and back again. Limited number, probably, probably two crews in an aircraft, uh, which would be two pilots, two bomb aimers, or one navigator and uh, one engineer and a probably one gun, two gunners and the wireless operator. So they only needed really the bomb aimer and navigator and the pilot to set up the th thing to d drop the bombs on there. Towards the end of the war we were, we were uh, between Lindome and Scampton and so forth. So when we got to Scampton, it already happened. So, but what, what they'd done, they'd, uh, they'd got onto the German high command and they'd said that the Dutch people were starving. Can we drop food to them? So they agreed to do this and they, they told them that they would give them an entry point and then they'd give them a route, a corridor into where the Dutch people were standing and so forth. And uh, they went and they, they put the food in, the, in bags and so forth in the bomb bay and then when they opened the bomb doors it went down there too. But they went armed. The two gunners were sitting in the turret with it just in case, you know, they hadn't done that. And the Germans had anti-aircraft guns all along the side in case anybody dropped bombs or deviated from the, from the route. But that was what happened really at all, and they went, uh, overall Bomber Command went quite a few times. Nearly all the squadrons went, but we weren't really on the squadron, so we couldn't partake in that anyway. And what I found was the people were very nice to the young lads, you know, as long as you were you behave yourself and that, that was the main thing and we didn't we didn't get into trouble or things you know it was daft to get into trouble anyway so wherever you went uh, somebody would say hello how are you you know and uh, i want to know the way well, they would tell you and so forth and lots of people in the area <coughs> would have people in you know lads in for ground crew as well as air crew for a cup of tea and a bite of soup and a bite of Food. and often chaps courted the girl so of course he was he was very welcome then when they were out. <laughs> we used to either catch the train to go into Barnaby if we were off into Scunthorpe from Barnaby Happers four in the afternoon and come back on the Happers ten and one thing we used to do we used to go into the one of the cinemas I can't remember it and they had a cafe there and we used to get Welsh rabbit and of course 
go and go and two crews of us used to go uh, and go in often. They got to know us. The ladies did in the young ladies. My w uh, met up a gunner, courted one of the girls there, Betty, and uh, they would give us double ration, you know, and so forth. And, and we went in one one night, and uh, one of the gunner, Ray Gunner, he wasn't with us, and they said. Uh, where is he? Oh, you know, um, um, Denard and everything. In the end, they had to tell him that he'd been with another crew and he'd got killed anyway. So he'd got back to the UK, but he'd got killed. And of course, that upset him terribly, terribly. And then if we didn't go there, we often used to go down to the Dying Gladiator in Brig. That was a pub. And uh, Mr. and Mrs. Clark were the, kept the pub. They were, I would say, old enough to be our grandparents, you know, where they were there, but they were lovely. And, uh, and we used to play darts with the farmers, <coughs> local farmers. And once one night, uh, towards Upper State, we were all finished our drink and were going. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, Mr. Clark said, where are you going, boys? Well, the fish shop's open. The fish and chop shop opens at Upper State and we're going to get something. She said, you're not. She said, you're going to send two, two of you lads, she said, and the rest can stay here. You can bring them back and eat them in the bar. <gasps> the farmers, of course, who'd been probably in there 20 years or more, they went up in the wall. <clears throat> well, you never let us do this. So she said, now look here, she said. Uh, those lads are going to enjoy their fish and chips tonight, she said, because tomorrow night they may not be able to, she said. They may be off somewhere, something may have happened to them, but they'll always remember it if, if they live that they had the fish and chips in the Iran Gladiator. And that was one of the very, you know, I tell people very nice memories of it at all, in Lincolnshire. It was lovely at all, they were lovely people. Elsham was blue, Kermington was brown. So when you, nobody locked the car, locked the, what's the name up, the bike up, and they were all, there was hundreds outside the station at Barnaby. So when you come, <coughs> pardon me, when you come off the train, all you did was grab the nearest bike, jump on and away. That's all. You didn't have any clips, took your trousers in the in socks and so forth. And um, if it was a brown bike, you made sure it was by somebody else's, listen, not by yours. <laughs> and vice versa, they did the same at Curlington. And every afternoon, probably about four to half past, the police, RAF police would come around. Are these your bikes outside? No, they're not ours. Some idiots parked them there. They you know, took your Carmington bike and parked it here. So they'd have the job of taking all the bikes back, sending them off to Carmington and getting Elton's bikes back from the same place. So. <laughs> May, 43, 44. I got posted to Blyton as an instructor. They call it screened, screening from operations. And then we were got together with the, the other four chappies and decided we'd apply to go back onto operations. But it oh, it took us long enough to do it. And then we didn't get in get to go back till March. And we were all instructors on Lancaster's at Blyton. So we thought, oh, we shall go straight to the squadron. No chance, we had to go through the system. And so we went to Lindholm for the, to do flying, you know, at all. And uh, while we were there, the skipper went sick and he was sick a fortnight. So by the time we got to Scampton in May, uh, it, the war was nearly finished. And we said, well, you know, there's still trips to go. There's still, there was still the British Garden one, you know, we could do that because none of us had flown in daylight on operations, we'd always been at night. And uh, they said, no, you've got to go on leave, seven days leave, this is the system now. So we went on seven days leave and, and I got a telegram after about three days, extending my leave by 48 hours because it was VE day at all. So, so we never did any operations at Scampton. Two things, two or three things we did which were very, very pleasing to all of us is the first thing happened, we went to, we went on to the continent and we went to a, a, a drone near Brussels to bring back ex-prisoners of war, chappies, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines and everything at all. And we got about 24 into the, into the Lancaster. 
uh, there was only, uh, let's see, pilot, engineer, nav, wireless operator, and either the bomb aimer or one of the gunners on the crew. So there was plenty of room. And when we came back, we only did about 2,000 feet. We had to fly and we had to come into the cliffs of Dover, white cliffs of Dover, so the chaps would know they're back. And we landed somewhere in Cambridge and they got off then and we came back to Scampton and they went into the circuit, as you can say, you know. They, some of them finished up at Gosford. Uh, I think that was a reception place for prisoners of war. And that's what happened. That's what One yeah. other thing we did um, at the end of the war, when everything was settled down, uh, I was as captain and we were told you were going on Tiger Force. So that meant we got to be trained for the, what's name, we were going out to India apparently, and they were taking the top turret off the mid of potato and putting a big tank fuel on there so that we could fly to Japan from India and back again. So nobody was very pleased, obviously, with, you know, from what the, if you were shot down in Japan, what they turned it over. But another thing we had to do, we also did Cook's Tour, as they called it. And we took the ground crew over France and Germany, Denmark and all the rest of the places. Different days and different places. Some of them went into Berlin and stopped the night in Berlin. They went to Gatto or Tegel. And then the rest of them we took. And we were only, what, 2,000 feet, I think it was. We took about 20 of them and they, they circled round in the aircraft so they could see, you know. And they were delighted to see all the damage done. And, um, particularly in France, etc., uh, there was more holes in the ground than there was people living in the country where there bombs and artillery shells and so on. So that was a, an appreciation to the ground crew uh, because they'd done a marvellous job. I would, I would say that without them we wouldn't have existed and uh, they were, they'd work all hours as God said, didn't matter how cold it was or raining or wet, if the job had to be done they did it and they did it outside. They only went into the hangar when there were such things like damage to the aircraft or they'd lost a, an engine and an engine needed changing and so forth. Otherwise, if it's a propeller, they change it on the, out on the air, on the side. And they only, they only had, they didn't have warm weather clothing, they just had a boiler suit on top of the battle rest and a leather jacket uh, without sleeves in and that was it. At all. And uh, oh, they were marvellous, they were. They were, you know, the, uh, as I say, our, we had one airframe chappy, Ricky his name was, I can't remember his second name. And every night before we went on a trip, he'd have a little can, about four, four pound can. Uh, it had four pound of jam and he'd have a drop of water and, like, and petrol in. And he'd clean the aircraft floor inside from front to rear. And as we went on, he'd say to the skipper, excuse me, sir, he said, but bring it back clean, won't you? And of course, they, 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 you lose aircraft, so the ground crew, a lot of them, work just on one aircraft, my fitters and, and engines and airframes, and their aircraft, and it was that was it, and they it wouldn't come back. And it, you know, and then they came next morning. There was a empty space there and so forth. So it was very upsetting for them as well. As I always wanted to come to live in Lincolnshire, always. And, but I got married and I, I stayed in the air force I was 68 and then I, I bought a house in Shropshire because my wife was a Shropshire girl as well. And I bought a house in Shropshire but uh, this last oh, 10 years. I, when I became chairman of the association, I used to come up about five times a year and it was 150 miles each way. I didn't mind, my wife was driving then, I'd given up driving. And, uh, but our Dr. Boro, who was the local doctor, he's our treasurer, and he said, why don't you move up to Barnaby, Ken, he said. So the opportunity came and we moved to Barnaby about five years ago. Yeah. And we've never looked back since. And does the, does the wife mind Oh, it? the wife loves it. Awesome. The people in the village are marvellous. They're lovely though. And mere fact that they'd seen me coming up 
from 1990 to the, you know, to the reunion, staying in the village, etc. And uh, they, you know, they know a new face. Oh, oh, you're up for the reunion because everybody knows about it. And if you'd, well, you were here a Sunday, weren't you? And you saw the people that came then. So. Oh, it's marvellous. I wouldn't want to move. If I won a million on the pools, I wouldn't move. I'd buy, some, buy a new car, perhaps, but not. <laughs> uh, yes, you got friendly with your, with your crew. And um, since the war, I've, I've been out to Australia to see my Wallace up in 1994. And I was in contact with the rear medical gunner, George Bishop, until he died last, last year, early last year. I'd been down to his house at uh, Canterbury. He lived there. But you also had friends, was the point. Particularly, every section had their own room. So the engineers, wireless ops, navigators, bomb aimers, pilots, always, nearly always, it was in the flight commander's office. Uh, you know, A flight or B flight. <coughs> and so you got to know them well. And I, I'd got a, a friend, Tom Moore, who was killed on the 16th of December, 1943. He's buried in Berlin. And uh, I'd always said to, to my wife, Valerie, I must go to Berlin to see Tom's grave, and you know, before I go, and, and that was it. And around, um, we kept saying about this, and then this year, earlier this year, she said, we are going to Berlin. So I said, so we went to Berlin anyway to see him, and, and we went to the uh, cemetery in Berlin. Oh, it's, it's beautiful to see. I'm, I've got a lot of photographs of it. And we found his grave and uh, we paid our respects to him, you know, as well. It was, it was sad, but it was nice to know. It was sad because when you look, you know, what, what 1943, he was killed there. <coughs> That's 50, 67 years. And I've had 67 years caught in the girl I love, married, have children, grandchildren, and I've got a couple of great grandchildren as well. So I've been very fortunate in that. And when you think he's been lying there since that time, that uh, it's yes. it's soul destroying sometimes. But yes, yes, it is. Mm. And there are so many as well, weren't there? Oh, oh yes. There's about there's about 55. Uh, 103 squadron and about the same number of um, 576 squadron buried in that cemetery. In that